This week, we welcome to the show the one and only James Bridal. And uh, James, I have a new kind of like intro that I'm trying. Uh, and I stole this idea from Dr. Tom Cowan. But what I do is I intro the new guests, and then I get the guest to correct or add add something to their to their introduction or their bio in case I missed something. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> so what I have is James Bridal is a writer, artist, journalist, lecturer, and technologist currently based in Greece. And if you're watching the video, you can see that behind him. Uh, he's had artworks and installations uh, for all over the world. And he joins us today to talk about his latest book, Ways of Being. Uh, what did I miss? Are you secretly Superman? Are there other things there we should tell people? No, I think you covered, covered it all uh, or everything that's relevant at this point. Nice one, nice one. Well, um, first of all, before we get to the traditional first question, congratulations on the book. I absolutely loved it. I genuinely, genuinely loved it. Thank you very much. That's really nice to hear. Super yeah, yeah, yeah. I would. Um, I was joking. Actually, Jay Springett says hi. I was just chatting to him on Telegram uh, briefly. I said I wouldn't relay the message, but here I am doing so. Uh, and I was just kind of explaining that it's it's as a joke, but I kind of mean it. It's the best book that I've read this year that I didn't write. And uh, oh, that's very kind. I, I like. I literally think of it as as a kissing cousin to animistic. I think that we're certainly toiling in, in many of the same vineyards. So for me, yeah, definitely, it was it was just honestly, it's it's really good. So well done. Thank you so much. It's really nice to have it out in the world. You know, it's it's a it's oh a god, yes, just waiting for the thing to come out. So I'm really glad people are reading it, and I'm happy to be able to talk about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's funny because I was James, uh, Jay just messaged me, right? But I said, oh, I'm, I'm recording with James Bridal in a few minutes. And he said, Oh, shit, I'm just like literally reading his book now. He only stopped it to make breakfast. So, uh, <laughs> so it is out of the world and it's in, it's in good people's hands. That's excellent. Nice one. All right. So, traditional first question, of course, James, is were you a weird kid? Yeah, I was, uh, I've been looking forward to this as a long term listener. Um, and uh, initially I was a bit like, oh no, you know, like, uh, I, I don't know what to say about that. And then uh, I was, I mostly started thinking about books. Um, and uh, I particularly remembered that um, when I was, uh, I think I guess I was about 13 and starting a new school and uh, new classes for everything. And in our first like English, you know, literature class, uh, the teacher asked us all to like, sent me a piece of paper and asked us all what our favorite book was. And uh, obviously I put down William Burroughs's Naked Lunch. And, as you um, do. As you do. Uh, and, you know, I mean, I, I thought maybe that was an interesting thing to put or something, but um, at the end of the class, uh, uh, he asked me to stay behind and asked me if that was the sort of book that I thought my parents would approve me of reading, which was genuinely a question that baffled me. Because up to that point, I'd had no idea that there was there were books that would not be approved of, or that my parents had any particular interest in what I was reading, uh, and that they would particularly express any opinion about it. Um, and he also seemed quite bemused at this answer as well, but sort of let it go. But of course, I immediately went and read all the rest of the boroughs that I could possibly find <laughs> to try and work out what it was about this. Uh, and I'd, I'd probably read a fairly decent bit at that point anyway. Um, and there were probably a few other things in the mix, but um, I think Burroughs was probably the thing that sent me to a lot of other sources quite quickly. Um, and uh, ultimately to, you know, a bunch of writers who really changed my life. Um, whether that's in the literary say people like Ballard, um, uh, or whether it's more kind of weirder stuff, um, particularly thinking of like Illuminatus and everything that surrounds that or um, uh, the other massive figure would be Grant Morrison and the Invisibles, yeah, cool. kind of later in my teenage years, when I would be started to making kind of zines, leaning heavily into Hakim Bay, and um, and trying to read, though not really fully understanding a lot of kind of chaos magic stuff and things like that. So yeah, um, uh, weird without necessarily anyone else noticing, but in my head, I guess quite a lot of stuff going on. Definitely groomed by William Burroughs. Did you, um, yeah. so I want to stay with that for a minute though. Like, was it actually your favorite book or was it just because you were a kid? Yeah, no, 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 it, it, absolutely, it absolutely was. I mean, there was, there was just nothing else like it on the horizon. I mean, in class at that time we were being issued, I'd, I'd had before that, I'd had a really amazing English teacher when I was kind of 11 or 12. 
a guy called John Mayle, who um, who got eleven and twelve, who basically put out a reading list for eleven and twelve year olds that was uh, was a, a bunch of canon stuff like English canon, but like Orwell and Graham Greene and these kind of writers, but also like Kafka, mm. with, with absolutely no hint that these were not things that most people would consider to be, you know, readable, let alone appropriate for for preteens. Um, and so I'd certainly kind of, you know, imbibe the fact that like anything was readable and anything was appropriate and I could read anything and you know I could maybe understand some of it and it was worth reading and you know in, in the English class I just mentioned we were being issued kind of young adult novels with large mm -hmm. type that just kind of that I just knew instinctively had no use or meaning to them um but no Burroughs completely opened up a, up a, up a world in which you know incredibly strange things happened um and language did incredibly odd things and was so obviously more different and powerful than you know anything else I'd encountered up to that point. So I guess that answers where it came from because if the if the next teacher said, are your parents aware you're reading this or what do you think your parents would think of this? I assumed the story was gonna go, actually my dad gave it to me, but I was then kind of thinking like, well, where did you get it from? Because you know, there's, it's, it's this kind of like murdering junkie. Yeah. I, well, exactly. I must have got it from somewhere and I must have got it from somewhere that said, this is weird, interesting stuff. But yeah. where that kind of primal source is, I'm not entirely sure now. Um, I think I was obviously on the lookout for stuff and I was possibly on the internet by then. So that could you know, have done it. Really yeah, back yeah. in the pre web days. So like something, something happened. So years and years and years ago, before the podcast became, became the podcast, when I was talking to Mog Morgan in um, Oxford, he said when he was, because he's older than us, when he was growing up in, I want to say Swansea, um, he said libraries used to be really good and they actually had like Crowley books in there that you could borrow, but they were under glass. You had to ask the librarian for them. So it might have just been a subversive library <laughs> in the end. Yeah, totally. Just an odd bookshop or something, you know. All right. Somewhere. So the, so the kid whose favorite writer was William S. Burroughs moved through his teens, uh, early internet, zines, Grant Morrison, uh, et cetera. Would you say that the die had more or less been cast at that point? I mean, is that the, the sort of... I, I yeah, know, I mean, I, I, went, well. I, went, I went back and forth on it a bit, I guess. These things kind of, you know, ebb and flow over time. And there were probably times when it wasn't such a huge bit. Uh, and then you'd kind of re-encounter something which would which would turn your brain around once more. Um, you know, I ended up uh, choosing between computer science and literature at a uh, kind of university level because you're not really allowed to to cross the streams of the sciences and humanities still within the education system. Um, and I always figured that like I could I could study computers, which I thought meant the internet, but I was wrong. <laughs> uh, um, I thought I could study computers and still read books and it would be harder the other way around. And that's what I did. And it mostly worked out though. Actually it turns out computer science is not really about the internet and involves a lot of incredibly difficult maths that I wasn't very good at. Um, uh, but then the same kind of thing happened again. Like I, I ended up by the end of that degree, hating computers so much that I went back to work in traditional book publishing um, just as, or just before the web, and then ebooks hit the publishing industry and it became necessary and interesting to kind of cross those streams again. Um, so I kept kind of trying to, you know, find or react against one thing only to find those things kind of repeatedly converging. And that's, that seems to have kept happening to me for the last 20, 30 years, basically. I, w I would say I resonate with that a little bit, right? Like it, it certainly defined my teen years and, and kind of identity formation that real um, 90s Grant Morrison chaos thing, right? Uh, and then, and I, I would say informed film and communications when I was there. But then once I started to get my first few kind of like proper jobs, and they were nothing, they, were, they weren't exactly soul enriching. It was commercial media. It was like media sales and things. But the money was good. So you sort of have those few years, well, I did anyway, of, of being benignly materialist capitalist and buying things for the first and for the first time ever being able to go out at night with your friends and not have like 
I have thirty dollars, and at the end of thirty dollars, <laughs> I go home because that's that's the end of the money. So I had a couple of years of that, but then as the career progressed, and we started to deal with thornier issues like um, what even is a newspaper once it's online. I'm like, actually, I know some people that have some thoughts about this. So I kept kind of. It, it was almost like I could fall back into uh, into the lineage uh, when I needed it as well. So I think I resonate with what you're saying there. Yeah, that's, that sounds probably familiar. I think maybe the university time was more the, the going out and having fun with friends. And then it was when I got poorly salaried employment that I had to fall back onto reading in my quieter hours. But yeah, there's definitely a, a series of loops there. So that's how you ended up, because if you studied, you know, computer science, and it certainly shows in the book, right? But that's how you ended up. And it's been useful because we're going to talk about you sort of building a self-driving car type thing. But that's how you ended up doing like the the writer stuff when did you decide like did you retrain uh, this is such a weird question to ask like artists but like did you retrain as an artist or did that develop out of the like the the writing and expression stuff you found post computer science yeah um no i've never i've 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 never had any formal art education um uh what happened was was that I was in the publishing industry and then I was doing more and more of this kind of slightly odd uh, computery stuff around the side, you know, really the basics, kind of setting up publishers with blogs, uh, working on some of like the very first smartphone apps for literature, um, generally trying to tell publishers that they shouldn't be scared of the internet although they should be scared of things like Amazon and they should probably be doing something about that, that kind of thing. Um, but at the same time, getting interested in the kind of meta level of it, as you say, like, what does it mean for literature to become digital? What, how does hypertext and everything that comes after it change storytelling and potentially in kind of interesting ways? Um, uh, and those kind of, those kind of questions. And I started, I started to give talks about them because you started to get some of the first conferences about this, these questions. Um, and I started to make things to illustrate those talks. That's really where it came from, in that um, there weren't kind of examples of the books or the websites that I meant when I said, like, think of the things that could happen. So I kind of had to make them so that I could point at them in talks. And a good example of that is um, a book I made actually for a conference called Playful, uh, which was a kind of weird uh, kind of independent gaming conference. Um, when I was, sorry, it wasn't Playful, it was something else I'd write, but it doesn't matter. Um, uh, and I, I wanted to talk about the nature of history on the internet and the way digital systems recorded history and the way that could change our kind of relationship to it in writing and understanding it. And, and the talk was about things like geocities and disappearing memory and the way people live their lives online in ways that weren't recorded in the same ways. But I, I was quite obsessed and I still am obsessed with the nature of Wikipedia as a, <laughs> an evolving body of knowledge that is editable, but in, in this case also particularly records its own history. So you can see that editing happening and you can see how particular stories and ways of telling a story, ways of telling history, which is historiography, have evolved in ways that just really weren't visible before. And, and for that talk, I made um, I made a book or I made a series of books. I made a 12, I made 12 very large hardbacks. That was the com a, basically a printout nicely formatted of the complete history of all of every single edit on the Wikipedia page uh, of, for the um, Second Iraq War. Um, and, and that complete edit history printed out, even in small type and narrow multiple columns, was 12 large hardbacks. It was basically the size of an Encyclopedia Britannica. And revealing that as a kind of pulling the sheet off it at the climax of this talk was very effective. And it's a kind of extraordinary, beautiful object to, you know, I, I do this trick quite a lot, or I used to do it quite a lot, of, of materializing bits of the internet into physical form because our monkey brains find physical objects easier to kind of quantify and, and poke at than, than virtual things. It's a neat trick um, and a very effective one. Um, and, um, this, and this object really seemed to get people to understand some of what I was saying and, and, and then subsequently took on a life of its own. And I started getting inquiries from galleries to show it in galleries. And I was like, oh, oh, have I made an artwork? <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> um, 
and that's basically how it started and 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 almost everything that i make even up to the present day is really part of the same process uh the artworks very rarely exist kind of on their own they're part of ongoing kind of researching thinking processes of mine out of which drop um artifacts but also essays you know uh op-eds in newspapers occasionally kind of uh, you know wh whatever it is they're all and, and talks and lectures as well they're all part for me of a kind of ongoing kind of thinking and doing process that's interesting i suppose it's a it's a silly question but does any artwork exist independently right um but i i, I love i love that and it's also not just art like that's that's magic right that's evocation or manifestation or something that it it's it's bringing into into matter something that uh, isn't, or at least is is formulated in a different way. It's quite alchemical. It's really cool. I like that. Um, awesome. All right. So I want to do two questions. I guess that can that's sort of a way of bringing us up to the book, kind of, uh, right? Because we've we've sort of got the the, the human development, uh, and then the kind of career stuff where it is interested in in like. Um, digital and things that do and don't exist and, and how we think with such terms and, and what have you, because of course the book is called Ways of Being. Uh, and so it's it's technology and uh, and our theory of technology and, and, and all the rest of it, right? So there's two questions, um, which is why this book and why Greece? And, uh, and I want answers to both and you can pick which one to go with first. <laughs> okay. Uh, why Greece first is probably easier. Um, um, which is that um, I'm a I'm a Londoner by birth and um, by 35 years of living there um, with kind of you know a few short extended visits elsewhere um, but uh, but uh, yeah I'm a Londoner and I still consider myself one even though I've, I've been sort of cheating on London for a few years now um, uh, Greece kind of happened by accident um, my partner was studying uh, in the Netherlands uh, on a kind of extended arts program. Um, and just at the time that they finished their study there, um, I got kicked out of my apartment in London. And it's uh, after 10 years of living in the same, very nice, very lucky to find place. And it's easier to leave the country than find new accommodation affordably in London. Got that fucking um, right, yeah. And, uh, and yeah, and, and at that time, my partner happened to be offered an exhibition in Greece. And as a muralist who installs kind of very large painted pieces in situ, we were going to be there for a couple of months. So we came for a couple of months and we never left. Um, we happened to arrive uh, just approaching the peak of um, the, the last one of the last few refugee crises. Um, and so there was a lot of really interesting kind of uh, community autonomous actions going on at that time, particularly in the neighborhood we lived in then, Exarchia in the center of Athens, which has a kind of long, uh, kind of independent autonomous organization history. And we got involved a bit in that. And then we started to get involved in the city's art scene. And uh, and Greece is, uh, for all of its problems, a really lovely, wonderful place. And so we've never left. Um, and uh, a little over two years ago, we, the same, process happened is that we moved to an island by accident uh in that we um uh we started visiting more and more regularly and then ended up um in the middle of a pregnancy uh lockdowns happening and by the end of the first serious lockdown uh we we had a baby and we lived here uh and and that's been really great for us um we've been very lucky yeah, amazing. Um, so I want to come back to that because uh, you, you sort of mentioned uh, a moment you had during like early spring lockdowns in the, uh, on the island yeah. in the book, um, which I want to come back to uh, probably later in the show. But I mean, the internet seems to be reasonably good the, the, on these islands. That's one of the things I had um, friends who tried to move their digital nomad types. And, uh, you seem to be able to live in a Greek paradise and, and and maintain connection to I don't know the hive that seems to work. Um, yeah, I mean uh, it's not always great to be very clear. It can be yeah. terrible, and we have not infrequent power cuts, and we have all kinds of other issues. Um, but uh, one legacy of the Greek—I uh, don't know how it's enshrined in law—but there is there is 
an imperative that's not always by any means served to kind of serve all the islands and this has very dis you know broad geography with a lot of very difficult terrain so what there is is at least a, a, a pretty surprisingly robust 4g infrastructure uh in order to okay, kind yeah, of yeah, yeah. search everywhere yeah. so yeah that's something that's yeah. something that helps the, um, i i um I feel you on the, it's not always good. And it's, actually this is sort of discussed in the book a little as well. It um, it reminds you that you share the the universe with the internet, right? Like it, um, the things that happen to you also happen to it. And that's obvious because I live on a little island as well, bigger than yours, but still an island. And uh, and if we get bad weather, I have slow internet and that's just, yeah. <laughs> that's just what it yeah. is. Yeah, or, or, lo or last summer the power went out, you know, one afternoon when I was sitting here and I looked up over in that direction and I could see the plume of smoke that was coming off the, um, well, a location on the next island over that I knew was pretty close to the, um, the, um, uh, the, where the power lines go into the sea over there that come to us. So there was this like very strong connection between <laughs> infrastructural failure and some kind of geophysical processes happening over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I totally get it. I can see the, uh, we have wireless, um, whatever wireless high speed broadband actually is but you can see the towers along the hills and if i can't see the towers the internet's slow and it's yeah. and there's something really phenomenologically perfect uh, about that, that that i'm i'm stuck in the same way there is the internet uh, so is that i mean the the moment on the beach um, with the swallows uh, in spring right? like obviously very isolated spring because no one was making it to the greek islands in spring of 2020 um I can tell in the book, this is weird, let me just start it somewhere else. Did you know when you came over for that first month or so, or about when did you realize like, oh, actually I might, I might quite like it here. I don't think I'm, I'm done with Greece because your um, relationship to the place is, is very obvious in the book and, and really like inspiring and, and, and interesting. Yeah, I mean, it, it was a slow process. I don't think there was one particular moment of realization, except possibly when we took our baby home and were like, we just need to get to an island now. The center of Athens is not the right place to be. And we've become attached to this other place that we need to get to as soon as possible. That was probably the moment when it was really very clear, but it had been creeping up for a while through that first kind of lockdown spring, which is the first was the first spring that I spent mostly outdoors in my life. And that was quite radically restructuring for my brain. Um, I mean, I always, I always say to people that that year, 2020, I um, I wrote a bit, book, um, had a kid, moved to an island, and there was a global pandemic. And any one of those four things is going to rewire your brain quite intensely. Uh, and so for all four to kind of happen in parallel, it was, it was quite an intense year. Um, but there were a number of occurrences the, the swallows that I talk about in the book, definitely being one of them, which were incredibly novel experiences to me. I'd never watched spring happen like that. Um, I'd never, I'd never, you know, been somewhere or spent the time or had the time to notice every single plant that opened over the course of months. And to, to in the most naive and simple and, you know, cliched way just really be in touch with the season turning in such a way and so it was it was a really incredibly powerful experience and we'd been getting to know Greece for a few years we'd, we've traveled over quite a bit of it and it is a really fantastic extraordinary place and and I never expected to end up on an island particularly I'm I love the mountains dearly um but this was the place that we found ourselves in and, and had these particular moments uh and they're still having them um, we saw the yeah. saw the swallows again the other morning. They've just arrived again. So this this it keeps happening. Um, yeah. And and I I started writing the book. I mean the the ideas for the book precede that. Um, and but I'd started writing the book in a kind of fourth floor studio in the center of Athens. And in hindsight, that seems like the worst idea ever. But I had no yeah, idea yeah. at the time that it would be ridiculous to try and write the kind of book I wanted to do under those circumstances. Uh, and circumstances and a number of interesting events that happened um, ended up with me writing it where I'm talking to you from now, halfway up a hill, kind of looking out over the ocean, surrounded by mountains. So, yeah. yeah. That the, comes the through, right? Things that happened around this that felt like 
mm, something interesting is happening. Someone is knocking on the door, and I should probably attend to that. Yeah, the, the, that awareness that 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 definitely successfully is conveyed in the book, the sort of imminence of the more than human, but also its novelty to you, and and you like it's it's very aware and correct of you, I think, to say that um, the book can uh, the island is a co-author, right? Um, and, yeah, and that's yeah, and and so are the mountains and the different parts of Greece that. Uh, I mentioned uh, in it, but yes. uh, having just and, and really worth stressing how completely unexpected that was to me. I, I make no pretense yeah. of being a kind of, kind of a lifelong nature nova. I still don't know the names of all the trees. There's eagles that fly overhead on a regular basis, and I still can't figure out what kind of birds they are. I have no idea. And <laughs> and uh, you know, I really didn't. And I expected to travel a lot to write this book. You know, when I first thought about it as well. But of course, things being as they are, meant that it all happened really quite locally. And I think that's been great for it. But again, it was hugely unexpected. Mm -hmm. My book was built by similar forces. Like I expected to travel more for it as well, because that's the only way I know, or previously knew how to write books. Yeah. Um, and and so it was more a, a bundling up of experiences, but largely co-written with my little island as well. So like, I, this is what I mean by, I view it as a, as a kissing cousin to animistic in, in a lot of ways, because it's, it's you, you clearly went through a similar uh, creative process and grappling with ideas that are a 70% overlap. So yeah, like I, I mentioned it already, it's an excellent book, but um, so that's Greece. And is that enough of the why of this book or is there something else? Well, I mean, the, the other thing I was say, I mean, there's a, there's a bit more history that happens in that, that my um, my artworks and, and my writing and everything that I've been concentrating on over the last 10 years or so, like 10 years or so ended up in one book that came out a few years ago, which was called New Dark Age, which um, like I always, I always wanted to be a writer and I always thought that I'd write a book about the internet. Uh, and I always thought it would be a book about how great the internet was. Uh, and it turned out to be really quite the opposite. Uh, in that, in you know, in my work, I'd been I'd been getting really deep into the kind of political and social implications of the internet, of what it was doing to to our minds and to society and to governance. And so, I wrote a book that's really about all of the worst aspects of the internet and other contemporary technologies. And it's quite a brutal read, um, uh, but it was really intended as a it's just as making a very clear statement there's no there's no kind of I, I particularly i rail against solutionism in it and it's intended not to contain solutions but just simply to outline where i where i felt that we were um and to the extent the book succeeds i think it succeeds in that of just me being like this is where we are and we need to be clear about where we are and be honest about the situation that we find ourselves in um and i'm still super proud of that book um but obviously, having done that, I did feel that it should then be possible to go into the next phase, which is then, okay, so what? Um, and that is, and I, I didn't set myself, you know, the task to solve that at all. That would be ridiculous and, and counterproductive, but it was kind of where my head was at. And so when certain things started to become interesting again, um, because I I believe it, it always happens with the things that I'm interested in that if I if they seem interesting they will prove why they're interesting in time if I kind of keep chasing them down that um, that you know out of that came the threads of of what came next of, of ways of being and particularly that not just in the writing but in and again even before the island and a, a bunch of other things that happened. I've made a very conscious and intentional um, a, a work to reframe pretty much everything that I do around the environment and to work out what that means and to say like, you know, if, if that is the necessary work in the present moment to, to focus on, on the environment um, or you know, everything around us or whatever it is, climate change, however you, you, whatever bit you want to frame it around. Um, particularly, how do I take what I know already and, and bring it to bear upon this? Not to just completely throw everything over and go um, 
become a full-time activist on that particular subject or whatever it is but like how do i actually reframe what i i know and think already and bring it to bear on this and what is useful about that and that's the real background to this is it's also the outcome of that process of me trying to think about you know what i can maybe bring to some of these discussions from my own particular perspective and background however like divorced from ecology and nature that that has you know been thus far yeah um i resonate with that it's funny because you mentioned a whole bunch of words i don't like like i literally don't like like environments don't exist um yeah, I, yeah I, 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 I i in the book i i, I explain why you shouldn't use the word environment yeah exactly but uh, the same thing like i this is specious and, and silly but it's true like i i am literally a climate denier in the sense that i don't think climate exists um it, it's a, it's it's like a, it's an artifact of the the measuring systems and solutionism and techno utopianism that got us into this fucking mess in the first place so i i like what i really resonated with the book and what i want to do with the rest of the episode and i hope we could do other shows because there are other thinkers that and other books that have come out around the same time like that blind man and the elephant idea that i think uh, invite like further discussions, but I actually want to talk about um, definitions and and some of the the topic areas that you bring to it because it's funny you say like, um, however divorced or far from uh, ecology and nature your experience is, kind of the point of the book is is resituating and re-relating these domains that our language um, makes separate, like back into some kind of relation and, 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 and technology being uh, technology and ecology being those th that a, uh, a polarity rather than a, rather than a difference or like a subset and I really enjoyed that about the book I really enjoyed you've you thought deeply about the the topic areas and the domains in which you've spent the previous couple of decades and and situated that thinking in the context of a cosmos that is mostly more than human and uh, and, I, and i love that so i'll give you a challenging one because it sounds easy except it isn't what is technology what's a what's a reasonably good definition of technology ah oh, well it's easy because i'll just quote someone else um <laughs> which is that i'll just i'll just trot out uh, Ursula Le Guin, who always knew the right thing to say and was smarter than all of us which uh which she says that technology is, is human humanity's active interface with the rest of the world it's just it's the stuff that we have to interact with everything else and and, and she's also very clear so it's a beautiful short piece she wrote called uh, a note on technology where she she she's attacking critics who say there isn't enough in of it in her work as in like you're a science fiction writer you're supposed to write about spaceships and starships and she's just like no like everything, everything we make and build is is technology, and it's fish hooks, and it's shoes, and it's clothing, and it's fire, and it's also you know jet engines and spaceships and so on and so forth. It's our interface with the world. It's everything that touches the world, kind of through us or as a result of us. But the other thing she says about it that's really really key for me, that's maybe more important than what it is, um, is she also says she says that technology is something that that everything everyone can do she's like i don't know how to make a jet engine but you know i don't know how to like make a pair of shoes either but i could learn like that's what that's what technology really is it's something we can learn to do uh, and that's the only definition I, I really need i mean in in my work i mostly concentrate on what she calls high technology which is you know computers and network systems and satellites and these kind of things because they're fantastic and interesting and blah 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 but i entirely buy her definition as well yeah, yeah, yeah. All out because obviously grandmother is, is always welcome around here. The only thing I would not change or amend to it is, would you say it's just humanity? Because obviously there's, um, so that definition of technology is the glorious elaboration of um, tool use, physical and non-physical tools. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but other beings be beyond humans, use it so what would you say that technology and this is really good talking to someone in greece about it because uh it's, it's one of those areas that the greeks thought enough with to go okay so techne is is a fundamentally um distinct but i guess not separate uh 
thinking framework, right? Like it, it yeah. techne is something that we can understand, but would you say technology is exclusively human? No, absolutely not. And you're quite right to call me out on it. I mean, there's there's very obvious examples of that, like spider webs or something like this. You know, this, it's quite obvious that other species make things and anthills or all these kind of extraordinary things that they were. But then, but also as soon as you, you know, so, you know, then to extend the, the Gwyn's R material interface with the world, then you say R is not just the human R, it's, yeah. it's all being exactly. material interface with the world. And it's not also, you know, I would also extend it beyond the material because language yeah. is a technology and it's a technology that's, that's not exclusively human. Um, um, yeah, so yeah, absol absolutely more than human. But, and it's, it's kind of important to, to amend grandmother's definition because that's kind of like a big part of, it's one of the main thrusts of the book is resituating technology, is resituating the human in the more than human and, and consequently like technology across the human and the more than human as well. And that's one of the ways we can uh, approach this idea afresh is is not to see it in a kind of is not to see it as human business exclusively, and also not to see it in a kind of Mary Shelley nineteenth century moralist framework. Uh, but but uh, well, you can do that, but it, it's more that's a subset of of a much wider much wider discipline. So I like that idea of it being the interface between like I don't know beings in their world because you you've used umwelt a bit in your book as well <laughs> what, are, yeah. what are the overlaps uh and, and I, that's another also, way yeah, yeah it's, it's also important to stress that you know one of the things i struggle with in my work and still struggle with and struggle to define and think about clearly is is the amount of agency to attribute to technology itself um yeah. as not mere interface or at least you know only if we're acknowledging that we are all interfaces between various things um, and all kind of beings that exist in relationship to everything else. Um, maybe that's a nice way to think about it. It's, it's beingness, but the technology itself has its own, its own beingness and agency in various ways, and that it is not mere tools. Um, yeah. That 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 you know, if we're serious about our animism, then we have to extend it to like spanners as well as to the you know things that wield them. Um, Absolutely. That's where I, that's where I would have gotten. And it's all, it's one of the things. It, it's my one of the trump cards I use moving people from panpsychism to animism is there are what we would call objects that are also beings and persons with histories and agency and and those are sacred objects in in uh in different cultural and, and spiritual traditions and so on. And, and and when you step into that world, you can then turn around and look and. And it and pose that important question, which is: is interface sufficient, or is um, are those the where a community, or dare I say, class of beings, uh, gets their stuff from? In the same way that we get our stuff from interfaces as well. Um, as you say, we're all interfaces. We're made up of um, the material we consume, and and we're sort of like slower moving sunlight ultimately in the end. So everyone is a kind of in interface of uh, materia. And so when we look at that, let's call it a band, right? Like, so let's go back to Ursula's idea of it being an interface in between beings and, and another troublesome word environment. Is that in that band, in that overlap, is that where the materia comes from to create a community of beings, at least in some instances? And the answer is probably yes, as far as I can tell. <laughs> All right. Um, speaking of, well, sort of like a subset, actually, this is a neat little tee up because uh, I like these discussions. Uh, there's some really, unsurprisingly, really good thinking with this notion of AI. And I've done a couple of shows on AI or adjacent to it before. And it's one of those fraught and exciting areas to think with. What's your definition of AI, James? Oh. Um, I mean, there's so many, it's really hard. Um, and I get really annoyed with it because I have spent a lot of time with AI and that, that extends all the way back to like studying it 20 years ago when it was really in the last like winter before it before it achieved its current kind of particular emanation. Um, uh, and it's really important, I think, to notice that no such thing as AI even remotely currently exists. And it's just a huge <laughs> fraud being perpetrated on everyone to even mention the words. Um, but at the same time, you know, it 
it has the potential to exist. And you like I have no definition of artificial intelligence because I have no definition of intelligence. Um, Correct. But but it's a nice shorthand for some kind of technological being an agency that exists in a way that we can point at. Um, yeah. And in particular, you know, most of what we point at is an imagining of a thing that doesn't necessarily exist, but on some level we believe must exist or must be possible of existing, which is some kind of technological consciousness being intelligence. Um, and, it, you know, what I've been most fascinated for most of the time is why we're so fascinated by this thing that, that really doesn't exist in the present, um, in, in at least in any anything like the way it's imagined in science fiction or by marketers or by anyone else. Um, uh, you know, there is something in our culture that is so eternally fascinated and drawn to the idea of an artificial intelligence. And that for me is the thing that kind of really has pushed me into trying to understand it in some way, um, trying to understand this, this thing that we're imagining um, as much as the thing that we're actually building and how that imagination and all the forms that imagination takes shape what it is that we're actually imagining and therefore yeah. how we also imagine everything around us particularly the nature of intelligence itself i love that it is some kind of because you're right it either um it, it does it absolutely does exist now if we widen out the definition of intelligence to something right. that actually resembles what we see in the um, the world or it does not exist and will never exist because it is uh, well it does not have physical expression because it's more like this archetype that has stalked specifically, I would say, European culture. You're speaking of Greek islands. They're, they're, uh, you, you have like classical Greek robots protecting like roads, right? Like so yeah. for two and a half thousand years, we've had this idea of, again, whatever artifice is and then whatever intelligence is smushed together. And it might be, as you say, like, why are we so interested in it? It might be some kind of like bird mirror with a bell on it, right? Where what, what compels and fascinates and constellates us around this archetype is the similarities and dissimilarities and that kind of eternal, like, well, what the hell is, what is our goddamn fucking consciousness, right? So yeah. um, I, I, I like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's the big thing, or well, that's a big part of it. It's like it is a tool for figuring out what we think we mean by an intelligence and consciousness, which is, you know, something that we are obviously fascinated with, whether for, you know, kind of loftier goals or for more like, um, yeah, eternal desire to put things in little boxes. Because if uh, one of the things, and we'll get to it later on, we're still in the definitions, uh, that just was like a mind-blowing uh, part of the book for me and, and has like deep chaos magic implications is the uh, your examination of um, randomness and, and sort of legium and sort of and so on, right? Because if we widen out AI to, let's just say, have a provisional definition of intelligence being uh, problem solving capacity or challenge addressing capacity. Um, then the sort of bingo ball system that was used in ancient Greece as a way of um, allocating public office is an artificial intelligence because it's actually uh, addressing a challenge or a problem using artifice, right? So it's one of those things where the Greeks invented artificial intelligence because they used literally bingo ball systems to, uh, to allocate office. Or yeah, I mean, they, they offloaded a huge amount of agency within what we now call democracy or ancient democracy to a machine. Um, yeah. And they considered its operations to be more just and fair um, and therefore smarter in some sense than anything that any individual human was going to come up with. Um, and so, so yeah, it absolutely fixed that particular sort of definition of AI, even though that they well, well, you know, yeah, exactly. Always the caveat, well, we're doing all of other right? terrible things and weren't terribly democratic. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, pedophiles playing, pe slave owning pedophiles playing bingo, right? Um, you know, one out of three ain't bad, I don't know. Um, let's stick with this, though, because this is, I think, hugely significant, because I think they were right. One of the things that's always fascinated me about, I guess, Greek mathematics, and this is why it was your, the, the randomness exploration you did was so mind-blowing for me, is um, 
you know, from Pythagoras on, they got geometry, right? And they, they built some nice buildings and what have you. Uh, and they took Europe another, let me get this right, 1,700 years to get to probability. Well, that seems weird to me. But actually, probability is a way of seeing a universe where uh, randomness is not some kind of sacred, right? Like, one of the definitions you land on for randomness, which is the mind-blowing bit for me, is randomness is the word we use for relationality of a set. So um, this is where the bingo balls things works, right? Like, so if there's 20 people and there's one public office or one meat tray, there are 20 balls in there. And what that is, is a artificial representation of the equivalence of the 20 people in competition for the meat tray, right? And so one of the reasons I think, and this is why I think it works better, and I think they were right. I think they were right that to, to outsource that agency, not to artifice, but to the cosmos, right? Because what, what it is, is, is as perfect a artificial representation of like an animus relationality as we can get. Like it is, it is democratized. There is no, uh, there's no voting machines <laughs> that get hacked. There's none of this crap, right? And and it's when you kind of said that randomness is kind of like a relationality within a specific set. I'm like, holy shit! It's like animus technology, right? And so I think they were correct because something happened. And I I, I base that on being a moderately, I, I guess I'm a professional fortune teller. Like I, I give readings to clients and so on. And there's something about just pure randomness that more often than not, more often than our attempts at speculating um, says something true about the cosmos. And that's not in the mathematics, that's just in whether or not you think the cosmos is alive or not. And, and the Greeks kind of did, right? So I think they were correct. Do you think they were correct? Does that make sense? Are you following what I'm saying? I mean, yeah, no, I'm following what you're saying. I, I mean, I think, I think they were correct politically as, as you know, some of the other more contemporary political experiments I talk about in the book seem to show. Um, and I think they were correct in deciding to invest this in a reasonably transparent machine, knowing that most of them were corrupt or corruptible in various ways, <laughs> exactly. um, as, as proven by their prior and subsequent history when this kind of thing fell out of fashion. Um, but, you know, so they were undoubtedly correct in kind of political science terms, in, in my understanding. Um, but yeah, to, no, what, I, what I don't know I don't know, maybe because I'm read or because the, the, the research isn't there or whatever, is is to what extent this was connected with a religious viewpoint or a, you know something deeper than purely the the organisation of a political body, um, which it kind of must have been, exactly. um, given the the fluency between those things at the time. Um, but, but also yeah, because you can't, we people, we didn't. It's so difficult for us to pass that because they haven't been through the kind of like Cartesian head trauma of the Enlightenment. They haven't been through, and it's still their fault that we got there, that um, they haven't had to recover from tipping so absurdly into the materialist naturalism that we did, say, 150 years ago. So we don't, there are things that they just, and the same thing happens in, uh, in like Egyptian religious belief, right? Like the, the actual, there is no complete or correct or um, beginning to end uh, myth cycle for Isis and Osiris because everyone knew it. Like it, it was just like in the air, <laughs> right? I mean, and, and the, but they, they, yeah. they, did, they did make the effort to argue for it, you know, and they wrote sure. down extensively why they thought this was the best system and so on. And those tend to be, but they tend to be reasons about human political behavior rather than like the gods say this is the best way of doing it. Yeah. So they were thinking about one another, but as I say, I, 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 I think you're right about the, and, and I haven't seen anything that suggests that they thought, you know, that they thought it brought them in greater touch with the cosmos, which is what you and I yeah. kind of um, uh, do, I think, feel about this. That there well, is something I, I about the nature because... of randomness that, that accesses something that, um, or at least clears the way a little bit from uh, you know a chunk of human intelli uh, intentionality and bias that gets in the way of us getting that message. 
That's exactly what it is. We're, we ours is a recovery journey, and so that would work for us. I, I just mean, and mine is savage superstition. You're correct. I shouldn't put it on the Greeks. Uh, I think. I literally think it works better, and I base it on <laughs> years of fortune telling, right? Uh, and and I don't, and I think that just would have. It, it certainly works better politically, and it's it's fascinating to think about, particularly for like a shared country where you have like Britain that, um, or no, a better example I think is the U.S. because everyone kind of claps their hands whenever we get like, or they get. Uh, a trans politician, like a trans man or a black woman or something in politics. And it pretty much just means you now have a black woman approving arms sales to Saudi Arabia rather than actually having the, the representation and, and input that, that randomness can provide, which is if 20% of the population or 40% is non-white, that means that 40% of the bingo balls are going to be non-white. And, and it's just better like I, that you can argue it politically because then you would actually get people who weren't in a system that just exists in this kind of like perpetual death machine of what we call the environment and, and other human beings you actually might have um a microcosm of community and and that, that would actually uh, anything can be better than this right uh, but i i honestly yeah, believe that's, that's what that's what contemporary experiments in direct democracy and citizens assemblies and so on are doing and are showing and there's an increasing body of you know again beyond beyond the politics or beyond the uh the cosmic um or at least alongside them there's also like a mathematics of this um and a, and a bunch of case studies and and histories that show that not just like as you say not just randomness but the the real products of randomness which is broader representation uh, and and very specifically more different kinds of intelligence different ways yep. of thinking being brought to bear on a subject change what we get out of that subject when we think about it yeah it's it is you get a kind of like a hermetic microcosm of an ecosystem right so you actually get that the diversity of connections I hate the word representation. I hate it. Um, that's why I'm, I'm using microcosm instead, even though that's a representation. Yeah. Um, you, you get a microcosm of an ecosystem. You get a yeah. microcosm of relationality. And, and that's just, uh, that, like, that, that was blowing my mind reading the book. I'm like, holy shit. So randomness, like going back to the idea that I just think about it from a chaos magic perspective, right? Chaos magic, as everyone hopefully knows, Pete Carroll named it that because there was a book, Chaos, by James Glaick in the 80s when chaos mathematics was like this really big idea. And it was not exactly what we're talking about, but the inspiration was that there are new and old kind of like epistemological frameworks, something like complexity and chaos and fractals that says something about the universe that has the, uh, that tells us something about magic. And so this sort of randomness, that's what I mean coming back to my superstition. And I, I want to add this to it. Randomness being this kind of uh, microcosmic uh, expression of, of connectivity and relationality. What's interesting to me is, as you put in the book, uh, well, I'll turn it into a question. Can computers be truly random? Hang on, I think you just went quiet. Um, did you? Oh, yep, you're muted. Let me unmute you. Uh, your mic is not connected. They might have unplugged. If not, just unplug the headset, maybe. It's weird, like if you can still hear me, then the headphones part of your headphones and mic is working. <laughs> ah, technology. Someone should write a book about it. How's that? Oh, yep, you're back. All right, you're okay, back. Sorry about that. So, um, can computers be truly random? Yeah. 
I just want to pick up on what you just said there about this question of representation because I think it's really it's really key. Um, you know, in the example that I use quite a lot in the book, the the, um, the citizens' assemblies in Ireland, there was a lot of criticism of them of, of them for being um, for not speaking for the people. That it was just these hundred people and it was undemocratic. When actually, what happens in that form of randomly assigned direct democracy is precisely what you're talking about. It's not like a subset of the people, it is, or a representation of the people, it is a kind of holographic microcosm yes. of the people. Yeah. Um, it, it, it is them, like fil like sorted and filtered down a little bit, but, but, but hologrammatically within the whole, not, you know, a, a subset pulled out of them. And I think, and, and that's, I think, yeah, really key to understanding the randomness thing. Um, and yeah, the, the examples I talk, talk about in the book is, is the, is, is, you know, having, or prior to the realization of, of this kind of fantastic um, is the realization that all of our lives are completely um, kind of entrained by machines that can have nothing to do with randomness at all, um, because it doesn't work in their universe, um, which is, you know, 99.999% of all machines in existence being um, computing machines, that is, being Turing machines, being being automatic machines, being machines that can only do what they've been programmed to do. Um, and as um, the great John von Neumann said, anyone who believes that, you know, you can program computers to make randomness is in a state of sin. Um, <laughs> there's no, it, it's not possible to program randomness because then you have to uh, decide on a way of creating randomness, which puts a pattern or program into it, ergo not random. There's always some way of recovering the original program. And if you can recover the original program with the randomness, it's not random. So, so machines, you know, or contemporary computers, as we imagine them, are simply not capable of making things random, which is why lotteries still use bouncing balls. Um, yeah. and, and a bunch of other weird, fascinating systems like lava lamps or decaying pieces of cesium um, or large antennas recording atmospheric noise. These are still necessary. Uh, and the quality of all of that that really reinforces some of these ideas about randomness is in order to obtain true randomness, which is necessary for computers in for like interesting and super boring ways like cryptography and, you know, um, they have to touch the world. They have to yep. kind of, they like us, have to remake their connection to the world through antennas picking up atmospheric noise or pieces of cesium, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they have to reach outside themselves in ways that computers have, you know, don't need to do or, you know, have yep. not been forced to do for kind of any other operation. And so it's the, co the coming together of those things, this, this kind of realization of the importance of randomness kind of cosmically, and the fact that it's the one thing that really gets at computers and forces them to change something fundamental about the way they function and interact with the world is, yeah, is super interesting and key. See, it is. And, and both of those things are it right, because if it is... Oh, God, um, you're muted now. Oh, am I? Um, if people in the chat can see, uh, if people in the chat can see if I'm muted or just tell me I'm not, because it's not saying I'm muted. Um, it's weird because you sounded a bit shit oh God, what is going on? once you, uh, I'm going to say it's your end. Um, if people in the chat can tell me. <laughs> All right. I, I will type in the private chat. Um, I think. It's your headphones again. Are you back? Uh, yeah, people can. Uh, oh, I'm back. That's cool. All right. So, um, what I want to say, because this this is that's the twin parts of why I was harping on so much about I think with my superstition that uh, the bingo ball approach as as an artificial intelligence is like a perfect animist computer, right? Because um, what you were just saying about hologram is is really really good. A computer cannot give us a holog. Uh, a holographic instantiation of uh, of like a set of relationality of like an ecosystem. It, it cannot. Yeah. Not all computers. Yeah, clear. sure. Like without us, right? So there's this yeah. idea that that it act, there's something cosmic or metaphysically important about uh, randomness, which is I think it, it's kind of like a as I'm saying like a a, a hermetic 
a reflection of, of a living cosmos, but it, they can do it if they're in relation to us. So it's these two ideas. You cannot simply, you, you can't get a computer, it's kind of like the, you can't get it to do full artificial intelligence. You cannot get a computer to be um, genuinely random, to, to genuinely like holographically instantiate an ecosystem, if you will, without living systems. So obviously, it, it, as you say, like you could use um, meteoric effects in the book you mentioned, like uh, atmospheric effects combined with stock markets or whatever, but th that's still, as you say, touching the human world. So it comes back to this idea that circling back to what even am technology to begin with, that uh, computing only reaches its uh, best mirror of the cosmos when it itself was in relation. And I think that says something very important about the cosmos that you can't actually um, represent it. Again, I hate that word. You can't represent relationality without relationality. And that's like, it's super key. And one of the things I was waiting to see in the book, but uh, maybe I missed it or not. What do you think to Tolkien's idea of sub-creation? Do you know much about it? Nothing, I'm afraid. Right, right, right. Well, he was Sorry. trying to, I think about it in terms of technology because he was trying to, everyone wants Middle Earth to be some kind of real, like he thinks that's the astral plane or that's the afterlife or something. And he's a good Catholic boy, so he didn't think that. But he did think it was something. And he did think by virtue of the fact that we have this God-given capacity to create, which is what God did, um, the things we create, our sub-creations actually do have a, have a kind of true reality in the wider cosmos. So that's how he would talk about, because he had to, I mean, we subsequently or retroactively invented something like fantasy literature. This motherfucker had to invent it more or less, right? Um, so he was stuck trying to <laughs> explain what the fuck just happened. And I think about his idea of sub-creation, which is also in that really fun nested way how Middle Earth was created, but that's his exploration of how human beings create things and what the significance of that is. Because I don't think the world, I think, I don't think the cosmos is a simulation. I think that's us using technology at this point in the timeline to kind of poorly describe relationality. Uh, and, but separation is kind of like, it allows the things we do in virtual worlds to have a kind of reality that isn't replacing it. And it's not, it's not the full answer, but I was just wasn't sure as I was reading through the book if, if you're familiar with this idea of sub-creation. Because there's something kind of coming back to that idea of computers well, I mean, the, the thing, random, you know? The thing that it, that it sounds like it relates to, not being terribly versed in it, but the thing that it sounds related to is something that I talk about quite a lot in, a, in the book which is the necessity, the apparent necessity of humans to create things for themselves in order to understand the ways in which those things already exist yes. in the wider world. And um, that's exactly it. The, 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 first, the first example I give of that in the book is the kind of um, all the amazing realizations made in the last kind of 20 years about mycorrhizal networks, about the, the nature of these, these kind of fungal networks underneath forests and other plants that connect all the plants up that allow them to kind of share nutrients and information but the extent to which it was necessary for us to build the internet before we could see that um yes the internet and the mycorrhizal networks are not the same thing but the you know the researchers who first discovered or noticed and, and understood what they were of the mycorrhizal networks you know, they were academics who worked in some of the first institutions connected to the internet. Um, and so they were some of the first people to be exposed to mental models of networks at all, which the internet provided. And, 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 and it went much further than that in that certain forms of mathematics, which were developed in order to describe the internet, which was a previously unkind, unknown kind of network or the scale free network that we didn't have the mathematics to describe. The mathematics that, that was developed, network theory to, to describe scale-free networks, turns out to be apply, applicable to these um, mycorrhizal fungal networks uh, that undergird all life on Earth. But there's, there, there's, a, there's a way in which we were simply unable to see those networks until we had built our own kind of toy version of them. 
and, yeah. and, and, yeah, right. and critically, I think something very similar is happening with artificial intelligence. Whatever Agreed. artificial intelligence is, whatever it might be in the future, one thing it might be is um, our own toy version of intelligence that crucially is not human intelligence. That is some yeah. other kind of intelligence. And as soon as like that arrives, even just the idea of it, to knock us off the pedestal of human uniqueness, suddenly all these other forms of intelligence around us blossom into view, you know, which have been That's, there all along, but, but we've, we've, yeah. we've been unable to see them because we, we haven't been able to make it for ourselves in some weird way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that seems to be a process that's happening to me. No, that's, I want to come back to that because that's exactly correct. But it's also basically what Tolkien said is that we can come to understand a bit more about God's creation event by this process of sub-creation and contemplating it, which is sort of true. Like if you invent all of Middle Earth, you think, well, that's pretty good. But then you look around you and go, well, this is better. This, I mean, this is me very early in the morning. <laughs> yeah, this took me decades, uh, you know, well done. And it's true, like we, we we use that technology for it. And I love that idea about artificial intelligence and, and language and communication, which is in there, because one of the books that changed my life was Eduardo Cohen's How Forest Think. And, yeah. and it's about deprovincializing human language. For people who don't know, um, and you got the Max Mueller kind of era in there, which is good. Um, for people who don't know, when we, when as humans we kind of invented basically linguistics but like the um this the study of of language and language through time we based it on a european um language family tree and then went looking around at other human language trees and then and said well these are different and weird and then when we went looking in the more than human world for things that look like the development of a very specific and it turns out aberrant uh, compared to the rest of the uh, ways of language developing and not finding it we're like that's it the natural world such as it is doesn't communicate and it's the dumbest fucking idea because it um it, it's a call to well what Eduardo Cohen said is that we need to provincialize human communication again which is to make us rather than the one example of it on the planet we have to make our version of how we do it like a, a minor and odd version of a thing that everyone else is doing. And that's Absolutely. the kind of story of how forests think, right? And that's what you're talking about there with artificial intelligence, because as we hit the point, AI as a pursuit or discipline began, well, 20th century beginnings, it's like we, we consider we'll have artificial intelligence when we have built something that most closely resembles a superior human intelligence. Why? Like that's um, that's anthropocentric, uh, and 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 we're kind of AI as a world. I think is has been for the last ten or so years at that point of realizing that that's anthropocentric, and actually, this is a calling to understand communication and language and intelligence in in a wider cosmic sense. So that um, AI may end up, and I think it will. And this is to your point, and it's in the book more or less. I think the close. The next step in artificial intelligence is intelligences that we build that look more like forests than look like humans, right? And that's that's this what happens when humans use technology. We're forced to learn kind of like bigger things about the cosmos. Does that is that a fair? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, the first step is just to you know for me really to 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 acknowledge, which some of us do, but it's not widely adopted, that multiple forms of intelligence exist, as, as you've been saying yeah. about language, that, that, that our way of doing intelligence is just one particularly particular and perhaps particularly odd way of doing something that is general, uh, that is done by, by everyone and everything in various forms. Um, and yeah, maybe some of the, 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 the knock on of that will be we start to actually make things that that are a bit more interesting and are a bit more in tune with the world as well yeah i think we're discovering an urgent reframing of ecology as we do this because you said something in the intro a couple of years ago i had a show at the guggenheim called technology's habitat uh and you i've got a quote for it here technology is the last field of study to discover its ecology uh what do you mean by that let's 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 close it out with that discussion um, well, so what, what I mean by that is that um, 
you know, that comes comes fairly early in the book where I'm I'm sort of introducing the idea of ecology generally, which is which is the idea that everything is hitched to everything else in, in yeah. John Muir's words. Um that uh, that everything is connected and that and also particularly that the real value and kind of impetus and agency is in the nature of those connections. And it's and it's just fascinating to look back over the last hundred years of science and watch as one discipline after another makes this realization. Because ecology really isn't a discipline. It's a way of thinking about one's discipline and its relationship to other disciplines. So, you know, you could be a, a you could have started as a botanist studying one particular flower and then ecology comes along and you realize that you are studying an ecosystem and that you yeah. actually, you know, deeply there's there's no understanding an individual um, or even a species or a landscape or whatever without without just that the, the boundaries of that interest just spreading and spreading and spreading through everything else um, and 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 my the case that I'm making is that technology is is hitting that point um, I, I mean I've been making it for a while and I've written quite a lot previously about the relationship between technology and um, uh, and, and the planet in terms of energy costs and, and what it's doing and extraction and all those kind of things that are no longer in any way ignorable, but also in terms of this, you know, these more sort of strange cognitive effects that technology is now um, so much more visibly entangled with everything else that to talk about technology without understanding it as an ecology is, is, is ridiculous and pointless. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, um, it kind of circles back to the very beginning, right? Because um, something Eduardo Viveros de Castro said, which I liked, is um, like theory and practice is itself a theory. So this, this idea that a human mind kind of in this detached bubble comes up with stuff that it then plans and implements and that now we have this technological device um thinking is a communal activity and it's and it's and it's in relation so that and, and creatives know this probably more than technologists as you say like technology is finally working out that there's a context to what we would call inspiration that kind of feeds back and interplays right so you're making in the context of something which then um is in uh, a, the, the web of the rest of this kind of like uh, innovation and new expression of things. And coming back to like high and low, even that, like from a technology thing, annoys me from a permaculture perspective. I remember talking to David Holmgren about this, but like when we, his book Retro Suburbia was about, and I hate the subtitle or the, the tag of it, which is kind of like planning for a low energy future. It's annoying because when I think of, say, um, Ways of heating or cooling in particular at home. I'm obsessed with this pipe, right? I'm obsessed with this 20 meter pipe that you put one meter down uh, in the ground uh, and you cool, right? Because it will actually convect hot air, which will I've cool cooled, yeah. Yeah, as it moves I've, through the pipe. I've read the... Retro Suburbia and I'm planning on building one of those pipes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but so the thing is, that's not low energy, that's free energy. That's literally. That works because of how the cosmos works. Uh, and it works because you live somewhere with warm air and cool earth, which is everywhere, right? And But this the idea that we call it low, this is that um, technology not discovering its ecology, it, it's, it's, or, or it's currently in the process of doing it. When, we, when it's situated in, I guess, that kind of like wider and more relational way or, or, or mode of being that other stuff starts to emerge and, and other things start to when you consider it free energy rather than low energy that is an invitation to take the next step into like well what else is free energy like it and free energy is basically just living in accordance with how the cosmos works and and that can be just underground pipes that cool the air right and that i think coming back to ursula's definition that's technology. And I would consider that probably she would too, but I would consider that high technology because that is literally free energy. That is unlimited air conditioning that um, doesn't, there's nary a hydrocarbon to be seen. And it's just that widening out of, of technology within ecology that I think is, a, is an optimistic promise or hope for the future, I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean the phrase yeah. I use repeatedly yeah. in the book is just is is this is this idea of technology that is closer to the earth in multiple yeah. ways, um, and say earth or cosmos or whatever you want to say. But that there there are in particular there are already existing knowledges there. Um, uh, most 
you know, whether those are traditional indigenous knowledges or whether the knowledges of animals or plants or beings or, or whole ecosystems that are sitting there, <laughs> um, that we are only just not even just learning exists, but kind of learning to see, you know, learning to learning to read. Um, uh, and and yeah, the one of one of the things that happens is is that all of those ideas between high and low start to start to break down pretty quickly. Uh, and those kind of distinctions start to become entirely meaningless. I love it. And we actually managed to pleasingly end um, somewhere in, in something of a circle all the way back to high low technology and uh, and Ursula Le Guin. So um, I have I'm, I'm traveling, so my screen sharing isn't as fancy as it usually is. Uh, but tell us, tell people, because uh, I've absolutely loved this chat, and we have but scratch the surface and i hope we can get you back to talk about these topics there are other thinkers in this space that i want to thrash more of this out with uh but yeah so like tell us more about uh, where people can find you and let me just show the, show off the book this is ways of being you should buy it it's the second best book i read this year um, because i read my own damn book <laughs> um yeah tell us more where, where can they get yeah. it uh, where can they find you uh, and so on you know, it's called Ways of Being. Uh, it's out in the UK edition now. Uh, it's out in a US edition in June. Uh, there's also an audio book, uh, which I did, if you want to listen to my voice even more. Oh, sweet. Uh, it's, and you can literally order it from any bookshop on the planet. Uh, that's how bookshops work. And I highly that's recommend excellent. you do so. All right. So you're not selling them just from the island. You can get it wherever books are sold. Absolutely. <laughs> That's right. Uh, and it's jamesbridal.com. Anywhere else? Any other places people want to, people can find you? No, that's pretty much the best place, to be honest. Uh, it's it's pretty comprehensive. There's all the artworks and the books and all kinds of stuff there. So it's a good place to start. Amazing. Well, once again, congratulations on the book. I, I genuinely did. I mean, I say nice things about all my guests' book, but like, I absolutely loved it. I think it was fantastic. I'm going to read it again. There are going to be some quotes from it that are going to be showing up in subsequent posts. I think you did a splendid job. So thank you, thank you and was, well done. It was a blast to write, and I, I really hope it gets in people's heads like it did in my Nice one. All right. Well, have a good one. Cheers. Thanks very much.